Welcome back, everybody. Just amazing to have these two gentlemen on stage with me. Um, when I was a teenager and I first seriously started buying records, it suddenly occurred to me to look at who made those records as well as who played on them. And the names Joe Boyd and John Wood and Witch Season Productions and a little picture of a witch on a broomstick seemed to turn up on all the albums that I bought. And I bought 18 of them with me today. I don't know if you can see them uh, around the stage. And they all turned out to be absolute classics of folk rock. And um, you can, if you can't see the albums, they're by John Martin, they're by Nick Drake, they're by Fairport Convention, they're by Sandy Denny. Uh, they're, there's just every name that you could think of at that time. And what I hope we might do, gentlemen, today is take people to a time and a place and evoke some music and some people. And the time would be the 1960s and 70s when you were both working together. Um, and the place would be Sound Technique Studios, which was really at the heart of, of all of this recording. And the people would be some of the names that I've just mentioned. So please would you welcome Joe Boyd and John Wood to the stage. So we're going back to the mid-1960s now, and Joe, you're an American, and you're here in London. What brought you to London in the first place? Well, I first came to London in the spring of 64 as a tour manager for a package called the Blues and Gospel Caravan with Muddy Waters and Sister Rosetta Tharp, Brandon McGee, Sonny Terry, Reverend Gary Davis. And I, you know, I kind of lucked into that job because I promoted some blues concerts when I was a student at Harvard and I got to know a local promoter and he recommended me to George Ween who was a promoter who was looking for a tour manager and so I came here and this was a time when these artists, Muddy Water, these fantastic artists couldn't get arrested in America and the first night at Bristol Colston Hall was packed there were queues of kids waiting for autographs out the stage door. And I just kind of went, I'm home, you know. <laughs> this is my, this is the sort of audience that I would, I, I, mean, I wanted to be a record producer. That was my goal. Mm. And uh, this is the kind of audience I want to make records for. Meanwhile, John, I think you might have been working at Decca, were you? I started at Decca. Uh, that's where I started learning to be a recording engineer, I suppose. And um, then through a series of stu a couple of stupid moves, I ended up at an independent studio, which was called Levy's Sound Studios, which was part of another company who owned Oriel Records. And I ended up there and didn't enjoy it at all. I was stuck there for three years and getting increasingly frustrated. And the technical engineer there, a guy called Jeff Frost, and I equally got frustrated. And finally, um, his mother put some money up, and uh, we started a studio. I mean, it really was that. Sound Techniques. Yeah, and that was Sound Techniques. In Chelsea. In Chelsea, yeah. You know, I mean, so Jeff left first to find a building, and in those days, you had to... Recording studios weren't that usual, weren't usually sort of put together so that the, the classification was for a light industrial un, under the, the planning regs so we ended up with this building in uh, Chelsea which had been a dairy in the, had a cow's head over the door didn't yeah, it? oh yeah yeah it, it, it was owned by this family who um, had been supplying milk to the sort of west of London I think for the last hundred years or something and by the time the building we were in, they actually kept cows in there 24 hours a day. Really? It, it was, you know, milked, fed, milked, and, you know, it was like intensive farming. So quite a conversion that needed so, to well, go on to make it into a studio. Well, it was, it, by the time we got it, I, I don't know what it had been used for before, but we took the, we took the first and second floors. It was a 1,000 square feet footprint. And then we knocked out the middle, of, so we had a double height, section in the middle so we had like three, 300 square feet one end 200 square feet the other and a 
big double height bit in the middle. And, um, you know, <laughs> put a studio together, you know, as, as you Jeff do. And built, Jeff built the desk, didn't he? Yeah, we hadn't got any money. I mean, much. So, uh, yeah, we, we, we ended up by build, having to build our own desks, build our own speaker cabinets, all sorts of... And before we'd finished... Before we'd finished building our own desk, we built one for somebody else. And, and in fact, what then happened is the whole th business sort of split and we had uh, a manufacturing... By, by, within two years, we got a manufacturing business as well as the studio. So Jeff was upstairs building the desks and you were downstairs recording the well, albums? Well, it, it was a bit like that. It wasn't quite like that. We had to, we had to have a red, red light in the workshop and as soon as you know, the red light went on, everybody had to keep quiet and stop hammering. So they had to stop building yeah, the yeah, desks while you did the yeah, take. Or, or not use the coil winder <laughs> or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. I'm well, just interested in, in your recording technique because I, I believe that your aim was to capture as much of the sound live, as it were, as you possibly could. Is, is that right? Well, there was, no, there was no other way to record in those days. That's what you did. You know, yeah. you got everybody in a room and you did the best you could with it. And it wouldn't matter, really, whether you were recording Judy Collins or a commercial for Crisps. Yeah, I mean, I think it's important <laughs> to keep in mind the perspective of historically, in terms of the technical history. When I started rec working with John, we worked on in mono or stereo and within the course of, I don't know, eight or ten years of working together, it went to four track, eight track, 16 track, 24 track, all within that period of time. Each one completely transforming the way people would work. But when we started, it was, you know, and, and when we finished, we still liked recording everybody together. Yeah, yeah. Well, you, I, you all, I mean, well, I, I think we, we always had in our brain, you know, and, and your mindset, because you set, when you set out on the session, or well, for me, when I set out, I've got an idea of how I want to see it finish, I mean, which sounds odd. But, so you would always be thinking in terms of a whole, of the whole. You weren't thinking in terms of a track here and a track there or whatever. You, you were always thinking in terms of the whole pic sound picture. Mm. So, and that's partly because of, you know, when we started, yeah, we, you know, stereo, stereo w wasn't even being used for pops. So was it about the placement of the microphones in the room? Well, do you just, <laughs> just place them where, where I'd always place them. John's being, you know, typically, you know, dismissive of subtlety and complications. But, um, but the fact is, I think people who've worked in studios today... Maybe not, not always, but in my experience, if you go into a studio and you're working with a, a young engineer and you're sitting in the control room listening to the sound of an instrument coming through the speakers and its sound isn't quite right, it isn't quite exactly what you had in mind, or it's a bit top here, a bit bottomy, or a bit this or a bit that, the first impulse of a young engineer is to reach you know, and do something on the board. And John would never do that. John would go, mutter, mutter, and get up and go downstairs and either change the microphone, move the microphone, or move the musician. Because the great thing about sound techniques was because of the, this big space, this two-floor high space, on one side there was the office and the, and the toilet, and the toilet had plumbing under it. So it was deeper than the control room, which was on the other side. And then in the middle, you had the full height of the two stories. So you had three different heights. And different acoustics, and Different acoustics. So you could stick somebody under the control room or under the office and toilet with a lower ceiling or in the middle with the highest ceiling. And there were baffles and things like that. So there was a lot of choice. And... I think almost never did John or, you know, ever want to change the EQ. That was something you saved for mixing. I want to hear more about UFO, though, because I did mention it earlier. Okay, you, what, you went yeah, away that, from that. So, so I got this... fired by Electra. <laughs> right. And so I needed to, I wanted to stay. I wanted to manage the incredible string band who weren't earning any money. And John Hopkins, who was just starting the International Times, wanted to stop 
being a photographer, which is what he'd been, and he and I got together and um, figured, tried to figure out a way to pay our rent. And he had just had a big party at the Roundhouse for the launch of the International Times. Pink Floyd and Soft Machine had both played, and, uh, and the atmosphere had been great. And, and I just said, why don't we just do a party like that somewhere every week and charge admission? And he said, okay, let's, let's look for a place. And I remember, you know, in those days, we got, he had a little mini, and we used to scoot around London looking at these venues, and he got a lead on an Irish dance hall in Tottenham Court Road. And um, it's very nice for me to, now you can drive south on Tottenham Court Road, but for most of my t life in London, you could only drive north on Tottenham Court Road. But in 1967, we drove south on Tottenham Court Road and parked right in front of where the Blarney Club was at the time, which is now where an Odeon Cinema, I think, is. And, um, and we made a deal with the, the Irish landlord uh, to rent, a, rent the place for 15 pounds on a Friday night. And Pink Floyd were the kind of house band. They were, yeah. There was either them or the Soft Machine, and then we added uh, Crazy World of Arthur Brown, and then it got so more. So he used to set fire to his hair m yeah, when exactly. he, most nights. And, exactly. Right. And so what was the atmosphere like at a, a good night in, in the UFO club? Well, I would divide it into two parts. There was, for the first three months, it was like a meeting of a secret society all the freaks around London went, wow, there's more of us than we thought. <laughs> and, and, um, and people were tripping and people were smoking dope. And, and it was just, you know, and we were showing W.C. Fields movies at 3 a.m. And, um, you know, I don't know, there was light shows in the corner and people taking their clothes off. And I don't know, it just, it was very anarchic. And, and then Arnold Lane came out which yeah. is a single you recorded. single I recorded at, at with Sound John Techniques. At Sound Techniques. Yeah. And uh, immediately, it didn't, the BBC refused to play it because it was salacious in some way about, you know, a guy stealing girls' knickers off the back, back line, the, the washing line. And, um, uh, but it got to number 15. And uh, make it a, it a hit every time, the BBC banning it, weren't it? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and, 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 and suddenly the whole atmosphere changed because it was now people who... It was this period from March 67 peaking in June when Sgt. Pepper came out and that whole, quote, summer of love. The phenomenon of psychedelic London, which had been an underground thing for a year before that, suddenly became an overground thing. And you had crowds of people in queues down the street and the police searching people in the queue. And, you know, it, was, it was, became a kind of zoo. Uh, so the atmosphere changed a lot. I want to ask you about Sergeant Pepper because Sergeant Pepper has a place in your story when it comes to connecting with Sandy Denny. That's it right, not? yeah. Tell me about your first meeting with Sandy Denny. <clears throat> well, Sandy... Um, I was, you know, I think I'd seen Sandy at Les Cousins or somewhere at some folk club, and I was... And we should be clear, Les Cousins was a, a, a Soho folk club. There's a, there's a triple album out at the moment paying tribute right, to Les yeah, Cousins. Yeah, exactly. Just, no, just come great, out by Ian Anderson. Place. But in those days, there were... The folk world was kind of divided in Britain, and I was intrigued by that, by how, you know, because... Um, Places like here, the, I mean, the first time I was in this room, I think at that end, I heard the Watersons without microphones, just singing the four of them. And, and I heard, you know, Louis Killen, and I heard, you know, and it came, mostly unaccompanied singers. And there was a whole circuit of clubs around the country, as I'm sure all of you know, where you really rarely saw a guitar unless it was being played by Martin Carthy. <laughs> and, and, um, and then there were other clubs, like Les Cousins, where you saw John Martin, where you saw Bert Jantz, where you saw John Renborn, where you saw guitarists and singer-songwriters. And I, 
in a way, I had come to England to get away from singer-songwriters. You know, I kind of, I didn't have a big opinion about that. I kind of thought, mm, I, I like the tradition, I like the rock, you know, the psychedelic scene, but singer-songwriters were not my cup of tea exactly. But, um, uh, so Sandy, Sandy. Sandy was sang traditional songs, but with a big singer-songwriter voice and strummed her guitar a lot. And, and so I was like, mm, not sure. And then I ran into her at the bar of Les Cousins. And, and she was hilarious. You know, she was just the most, the funniest person and just completely surreal as a character. And so then the next time I ran into her, um, I don't know, we ended up going for a bite to eat and it was like two o'clock in the morning and, and she said, I'm never going to get home to Wimbledon. You've got to drive me. And I said, I'm not going to drive you to Wimbledon. You know, <laughs> you must be joking. It's, you know, it's miles away. She said, this was June of 1967. And she said, I have a tape of the new Beatles record, which hadn't been released yet. And everybody was talking about it. But a friend of hers had recorded it off. They'd played the whole record on Radio Luxembourg. This is Sergeant Pepper? Yeah. And a friend of hers had recorded it off the air. And she said, I've got that tape. And if you drive me home to Wimbledon, <laughs> you can hear the tape. <laughs> and so, OK. <laughs> you know, so. We drive to Wimbledon, we go and she's tipped, you know, her parents were asleep, this dark, sort of quite large house. And so I said, okay, well, let's hear the record. She said, well, you know, my parents are asleep. I said, well, come on, you promised I'd come all the way out here to Wimbledon. And so we ended up in the coat closet in the front hall with all these coats around us and a little Wallenzak tape recorder. And she turns it on and there it goes you know, Sergeant Pepper, the whole thing. We listened to the whole thing, the two of us sitting there. And I think for her, it was a real moment, you know, because I think she, in that moment, realized that what she really wanted was the bigger canvas of working with other musicians and doing things, not just singing Scottish ballads and, you know. And I think very soon after that, she went to Denmark to do that record with the Straubs when she recorded her first version of Who Knows Where the Time Goes, because she, she knew they were gonna, she was gonna have to sing their songs. And so she felt, I better have a song. And that was the first song she ever wrote. She was 19 or something, wasn't yeah, she? Yeah, she'd never written a song before. Oh, let's see, I'll write a song. Oh, I guess I'll write Who Knows Where the Time Goes. <laughs> Unbelievable. You know, I mean, Anna, Anna McGarrigal, just as a footnote, heard yeah. that Kate had started to write songs in New York, and she thought, well, to compete, my, my sister, um, um, I better write a song too. So she thought, oh, I better write a song. So she wrote Heart Like a Wheel. <laughs> so the first song of these yeah. two. John, we're coming to the studio yeah. in a moment, but no, I just want to get, a, I want to, get no, to, to Fairport Convention as well, because yeah. you were obviously involved with Fairport Convention. Did you bring them together with Sandy Denny, or did they do that no, themselves? You know, it's a, it's a funny story that I basically know I mean, I thought about it because I, from the beginning, when I minute I signed Fairport, I thought it was all about Richard, that he was such a talent I couldn't not sign them. But I wasn't that sold on Judy Dibel as a vocalist. And I didn't really say, you know, you got anything, but I sort of, when they said, well, we're thinking of maybe changing, I said, good idea. And... Um, but I didn't recommend Sandy, and I was, I had to go to America with the Incredible String Band, and I called my office every day, and I called my office one day, and they said, guess what, the Fairport have added Sandy Denny as vocalist, so I went, whoa! And, um, and the next one, as soon as I got home, I went straight to a rehearsal, and I was, I thought that the problem, the reason I didn't think it was an obvious idea was because I thought Sandy would kind of eat them alive. I thought that she was such a powerful personality and so, you know, she cursed and she drank and she shouted at people and, and 
and, and they were quite polite. And they were all very little, polite little Muswell Hill schoolboys, you know. <laughs> and and um, and then I got to the rehearsal, and Sandy was completely well behaved and very, and because she was completely in awe of Richard, you know. I think the minute she realized what she was dealing with, with Richard playing guitar behind her, she was like, "Okay, anything you say." Mm-hmm. And she, you know, got very quiet and very you know, calm, and just whatever, Richard, whatever you say. You, you must have heard this developing, John, in the studio when they came to do oh, oh, one yeah, half yeah. Oh, Well, yes. I mean, the first Fairport album was a, um, for Polydor uh, was really hard work, and I can't say that I was terribly impressed. I remember uh, <laughs> Joe telling me that, you know, Richard is going to be one of the greatest guitarists in the world, and this is like 16-year-old fresh-faced. <laughs> 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 you know, I thought, what? Um, and it really was it really was hard work the first the first one and then when we did uh, what we did on our holidays um, it, what Joe says about sand is interesting but there was always a I felt there was always some tension between Sandy and Ian you know, oh yeah Ian Matthews, Ian Matthews. Ian, was about Ian, to that Ian time. really hadn't come from that that yeah. know, he'd, he'd, he'd come from a sort of he was, in a he was pop more of a band, country country singer, or with, with, well, at the time he'd been in some, something like I don't know, he was in a group called the Pyramid. That's which it, had, the Pyramid, which, yeah. which had a gimmick, which were they had three vocalists in front of the curtain and the band behind the curtain. Right. Yeah, <laughs> yeah but it, you know, it was very much a sort of singles pop. Yeah, yeah. Pop yeah. Outfit, and Fairport you know? Convention was very different from yeah. the Fairport oh, yes. Convention yeah, that yeah, became yeah. the folk rock band, wasn't it? Because this yeah, was yeah, they were influenced they, by American artists, yeah, mostly so yeah. yeah. like yeah. Airplane, Birds. You know, yeah. th- th- those were the influences. So they were very different. And it wasn't really until, I mean, I always thought the real breakthrough, I suppose, the sort of big difference was when we got to the end of Unhalf Breaking, the third album. Um, the whole album pretty, was pretty much in the can, and 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 we recorded. Mo- we started it all at Sound Techniques, um, and we'd only got four track at the time, and so we finished it off at, 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 at uh, Olympic in Barnes, and uh, running it all up to eight track and doing the overdubs, and then they finally said, "Well, we've got this one title we want to do." And by this, and we've got you know Dave, this guy Dave Sawbrick's coming to play the violin. Because he wasn't a two, member of the band. We did two titles that night. We did we did uh, Seat to Drive. Yeah, but that, but, and the, yeah, but Seat to Drive was after the, the the main event, and it was right. an afternoon. It wasn't even an evening. I think it was an afternoon. Right. And the yeah. main event was Sailor's Life, yeah. and they said we don't want to rehearse it or go through it. We just you know you could, we're just going to do it, and that you've got to do it in a one and. And that was significant because it was the first time you heard Swarbrick and, well, and that Thompson. Was first, that was significant because that, that was straight out of the sort of traditional British songbook for whatever, you know. Because uh, all the other songs, uh, you know, well, most of them are self-penned in the obligatory Dylan number. Was it the first time that Swarbrick had a pickup on his, on his yeah, violin as yeah. well? Probably, yeah. Yes, first time he went electric, yeah, yeah, as it were. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, he'd, yeah. He'd, never, yeah. he'd never played yeah. with an electric pickup, but yeah. he, was, he was sort of intrigued by it. Yeah. And it went down as a winner. I mean, that's... Yeah. And then we have to deal with the tragic events that, that yes, unfolded yeah, yeah, before Legion yeah, Leaf yeah. because there was a car crash, a, a van crash, as they were coming back from a gig uh, when the road manager fell asleep at the wheel and uh, Richard Thompson's girlfriend and Martin Lamble, the drummer, yeah. were yeah. both killed. Yeah. And that must have been the most horrendous blow for the yeah. band, Joe, did you speak to them at the time? Well, well I was, I was in America. Back. We were in America. Yeah. We were, I think we were mixing the album. Yeah. And we were um, mixing it I in, flew back yeah. and, uh, you know, and they, their first, I think I spoke to Simon or Ashley or Richard, somebody, first thing they said was, it's over, we're never going to, the group will break up. Because they couldn't, you know, they just didn't want to th- imagine carrying on without Martin. And, and playing the material that they'd recorded with Martin would have been yeah, very difficult yeah. for them, presumably. Mm. And, and eventually, they, and this is, this is how we come to have this word that's being used tonight for the subject of this talk, folk rock, because, <laughs> because um, they finally said, okay, we're going to carry on, but we're not going to do any of the same material. We're going to have to have a whole new repertoire and they were they 
the, what they'd done with Sailor's Life really resonated with them. And when they decided what they were going to be as a completely new blank sheet was a band that played British traditional music with that lineup. And that became Legion Leaf. You know. And, and yeah. Dave Swarbrick was added to the yeah, band. Dave, yes, yeah, Dave yeah. Mattix arrived uh, yeah. Yeah, from, yeah. He was a, from a dance music background. Yeah, and yeah. I think I, I've always felt that that was one of the most important things that made that work, was that Mattix was not a rock drummer. He was not a backbeat heavy guy. He had played for, you know, big band jazz, big band sort of tea dances and you know, mecca ballrooms and stuff like that. And, um, and so he didn't have that rock impulse. His impulse was, what's, where is the dance rhythm in this? And so that was the what, what he would play. And, um, and I think that's what made the record, that's what makes the record endure, is the, is the fact that it's rhythmically so unusual and so different and so new and as and it's a, it's a you know it's something nobody ever really did before i mean you know obviously jimmy shand records as a drummer <laughs> you know but this was applying a whole other sort of thought process with ashley and richard and simon uh working with swore i mean with Matex. And John, John, were you aware that you were creating a new sound? Because that's really what was happening in the studio when you were recording Legion uh, Leaf. Oh, God. It, I, I had a, Richard and I had terrible arguments in the recording <laughs> of Legion Leaf, actually, because Richard was very hung up on the band. The Big Pink album had come out, yeah. and, it, and, he, and, he, and he was trying to make me... Uh, somehow he wanted DM to sound like... Um, Leave on Helm. Leave on Helm, you know. And he's like wanting, wanting to roll the top off the drums. And I mean, it's like everything that I would never do normally. And no, we did have quite a lot of argument about it. He's, uh, I remember, John, you know, these... Because, you know, the, the sound of the big pink, the sound of Leave on Helm's snare drum on that is very thud, thud. But it's because of the kit he plays. <laughs> exactly, you know? exactly. It's, it's, and, it, it, and, and, um, and they would keep saying, for John, we wanted to sound... And John kept saying, if you want it to sound like that, you have to play it like that. Yeah, or, or get leave on hell. <laughs> get, get a new drum kit. Yeah. 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 No, I don't really. And I'd, I'd, so it was rather fraught in its genesis for you. Yeah, it was. Yeah. Yeah. And it, it's, I, I can't say it's my... There are two or three tracks on it I really like, but it, I much prefer, I, for me, it's sort of... Unhalf Bricking was, is my, still my favourite Fairport mm. album. I think it's true to say that no... Two Fairport albums have the same right. lineup from that classic period, anyway. Yeah. Uh, was that disturbing for you as a producer, or did you well, enjoy that? I mean, it was depressing that, I mean, I was really blindsided with Sandy and Ashley leaving right after Leech and Leaf came out. So you established this new sound, yeah. and then two and of then the key two people who created yeah. leave the band. Yeah. <laughs> And, um, but I have to say that, you know, that year from the time that Sandy and Ashley left, when Dave Pegg joined, and that was a funny story, because Pegg, um, basically they, you know, they needed a new bass player, and they were putting ads in Melody Maker and all this kind of stuff, and Swarbrick kept saying, I know this guy in Birmingham, he's a really great bass player. And they kept saying, Swarb, just back off, you know. You're not a rock and roller, you're a folky. What do you know about ba electric bass players? You don't know anything. And he said, no, no, this guy's really good. Well, who's he play with now? The Ian Campbell Folk Group. <laughs> and, 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 and they said, Richard and Simon said, come on, get out of here, Swarb, you know. And he just made such a pest of himself that they said, Okay, bring him down, we'll audition him, you know. And so they set up this, this, it was like four bass players coming at different intervals, and they set up in a rehearsal room, and I went there, and, I, and Peg comes down, he's a bit shy, and he comes in, he plugs in, his, he has this electric bass, not a stand-up the way he plays with Ian Campbell, 
And so I think they decided they'd get rid of him quick. And so they said, okay, we'll do Tam Lin. And they start off Tam Lin at like double speed. And it has all those very complicated bass runs that Ashley had recorded, you know. And Peg just goes, you know, like, like playing absolutely the parts perfectly in time at speed and more powerfully than Ashley ever thought of playing them. And they're all kind of looking at him like, who is this guy? And within about 15 minutes, they had a new bass player. Wow. Uh, <laughs> Let's move on to some yeah. other artists that you work with. I mean, I, I, I want to talk about Nick Drake, um, obviously, who played a big part in both your lives. And um, I, I wonder how you recall your first meeting with him, Joe. Well, you know, he, he came into the office because I, Ashley Hutchings is the one who saw him, heard him play, and thought, got his phone number, and then gave it to me and said, call this guy. He's really interesting. I called him. He came in, left me a tape, shuffled, you know, very quiet, didn't say much. And then I heard the songs, three songs, and I thought, wow, this is pretty amazing. And so I called him up and he came back in and we, you know, we had a very nice conversation. He agreed with everything I suggested about the, and a lot of what I was suggesting was kind of influenced by the new Leonard Cohen album and also by In My Life. And then... Um, so you, you were know, suggesting arrangements yeah, to him yeah, for the and songs? Said, yeah, and, and, but then of course we had that weird experience, you know, I, in the book that's out, Richard Morton Jack's book tells a little more backstory about during this time that we were trying to figure out how to do this record, he was, his relationship with Robert Kirby was just grow, in, expand, was yeah. evolving. So you were looking for an arranger. Right. We hired somebody recommended by Peter Asher, who'd done some string charts for the James Taylor record on Apple. And then we didn't really like it. And, um, and Nick certainly didn't like it. You yeah. know, and well, he was John and I didn't yeah. like it either. And Nick yeah. was suggesting Robert Kirby. Yeah, he said, I've got this friend at college. Yeah. And, you know, because, you know, Joe and I go and <laughs> sort of well, but not, I, not, not 100% agreed with it. But anyway, but, you know, so what? So, so his friend at college. And I never realised until uh, Richard Morton Jack's book came out how long a gap it was yeah. be between the Houston stuff and, 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 the, uh, and, and, and Robert turning up. But anyway, the, the, the sessions with Robert, we'd already recorded two or three titles with Nick, with um, probably with just solo cello and other, you know, bits and pieces. Danny Thompson. Uh, yeah, and done stuff with Danny. And um, anyway, so Robert comes in and uh, he tells us what the, li the line-up he wants, which is basically double string quartet, you know, and um, I get it, we booked him out of the ECO, I think. Yeah, and, so. and Robert proved himself, obviously, in that session. So, well, Robert turns up, you know, and I think the first thing we did was, uh, we just, we searched, like, way to before, blue. was way to blue, and you just, I just pushed, pushed the faders up, and it just, and it, it's Yeah, I mean, I was, I was just, I'll never forget that moment, because I, you know, in, in, you're in the, this control room up, above the studio in Sound Techniques. And I was, John was down arranging microphones and then he would always want to listen to each instrument separately. And so I'd hear this line with sort of in the distance, the other parts. And I go, oh, that sounds interesting. And John can, no, no, you can't hear it. You know, I want to hear that, oh, I need to hear the cello on its own. And I'd say, can I hear it all? No, 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 you can't hear it now. And, uh, you know, and so I was sort of thinking, I want to hear it all together. And finally, John pushed all the faders up and the sound came and I just went, oh, my God. And did you feel the same, John? Oh, yeah. Mm. Yeah. 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 <laughs> you know, you know, you know when, I know quality when I hear it. <laughs> <laughs> but but the, the issue for Nick, presumably, was, was how to promote his record because, you know, yeah. you could make a beautiful record and you did make three beautiful records, but he had difficulty going out live, didn't he? Yeah, he, he was, you know, I mean, the thing that's so frustrating and so maddening about the story of Nick and um, 
the one moment where the circumstances were perfect is where his story crosses with Fairport and Legion Leaf because that, at the, in the autumn of 69, uh, when um, they had finished this, we'd finished this record and they were going to relaunch their new lineup with a concert at the Festival Hall. And it was, a, it was sort of happened because Roy Guest had a date and he said, come on, let's do fair, let's get it all rolling, let's put Fairport, even before the record came out. And so the, nobody had heard what they were going to do. And the audience was real fans. You know, they were fans of Fairport, they were fans of Sandy, Richard, they were fans, I dare say, even of Witch Season. You know, and the place was full. And because of the tragedy, it was very respectful. You know, everybody was really on their best behavior. And John and Beverly came out and did... John Martin. Yeah, John, John Martin, Beverly, Beverly Martin. Martin came out and did half an hour as the opening. Cause, because Fairport couldn't do a whole concert because they didn't have a big enough repertoire. They'd only done enough for a record. 40 minutes, 45 minutes. So that was all we knew. That was all they were going to do in the second half of the concert. And so John and Beverly did half and they were good. And they went off and Nick Drake comes out just by himself. And he says nothing. And he starts, he plays a song and then after the song he retunes the guitar. And he has no jokes, no patter. All he does is look down at the guitar and retune it. And then he plays another song and then he retunes his guitar because every... And what I later learned about Nick was that that unique sound of his chords on the guitar come from his attempt to, sound, to emulate the piano chords that his mother made because she was a songwriter and she wrote songs that were positioned somewhere between you know, um, Noel Coward and Flanders and Swan and I don't know, something like that. But she had this very self-taught way of playing the piano. And Nick grew up with that sound. And that's the sound that he's replicating in these odd tunings. But he said nothing. And then he played his 20 minutes or 25 minutes and got up and walked off. And he got this huge ovation. The crowd just, and they kept absolutely still for the entire time. And I ran backstage and said, get back on stage and do an encore. Really? And he did. He kind of went back and he played Things Behind the Sun, which I'd never heard, which he'd never offered to us for the record. We were in the middle of making Brighter Later and he'd never suggested this incredible song. And you could see what he could do with, an, you know, how an audience could respond to him. But then, you know, I would see him at a club and there's people drinking beer and putting their glasses down on the table and, and he takes five minutes to tune and everybody starts talking to the person at their table and he mutters something very, very quietly into the microphone. Nobody stops talking. And then he starts playing very quietly. Nobody stops talking. And the whole thing would be so demoralizing to him that he just would leave the stage. And, you know, and John, were, you aware, were you aware of the pressure on him and the, the, the mental health issues starting to emerge? Uh, well, yeah, but not until well after. It was well after, um, brighter later. Well, really. but, but yeah. I have to say, John and his wife at the time um, but, uh, were very, very supportive of Nick and used to, you know, she, you know, Invite Nick for dinner. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Like I mean, you know, and he used to come and. Stay. I mean, after, after Five Leaves left, he'd, you know, he used to come and stay for a couple of days. When I was living in Suffolk, and uh, I mean, one day we even took him over to see Danny Thompson, who was living in. Really? Yeah. Well, presumably, they're two very different characters. <laughs> they were, and they weren't. Funnily enough, um, Nick was always. I, I always felt it was a clash, a real clash of cultures with Nick. I don't, don't think Nick was ever really suited to the rough and tumble of a popular folk, whatever you want to call it, musician. I mean, the... the I, well, but, but, you know, in a way, I, I, you know, there's, there's, 
it's true in a way, but there's another side of that, which is that I loved seeing Danny and Nick together because oh, yeah. Nick was very shy yeah. and he never said anything. Yeah. And Danny would come in and slap him on the back and say, what's your cat got your tongue? Yeah. You know? it, it's a shame that they never gigged, actually, yeah. because mm. that probably might have worked. Yeah, because mm. Danny could have yeah. probably talked to the yeah. audience. And, yeah. and, 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 and just, I suppose in some ways, Nick, I think Nick always needed reassurance in a way. And, and but, could but, he be assertive in the studio? Christ, I mean, did he know yes, exactly yes, what he wanted? Yeah, oh, yes, I'm the most assertive person I've probably ever worked with. Really? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Because he wanted a different approach for Pink Moon, didn't he? Well, even before that, when we were, when we were recording uh, Five Leaves, um, when we were recording right, right. Brighter Later, uh, at least two tracks went down the tubes because he wanted to change the drummer, and that's how we started using Mike Kowalski. Right. So, but oh, he, yeah. as I understand it, he wanted to, he wanted to yeah. be more stripped back, to be more. more uh, well, well he, yes, after, apparently, after I you know, I have a, never knew this at the time, but apparently, this interview he did with Jerry Gilbert, um, saying that he just was that's all he wanted to do for his next record. He just wanted to just do it with guitar and in the studio with me. And apparently, you know, but I I never knew that. All I ever, you know. I, did, did you, I kept in contact. Well, I mean, did he tell that to you, Joe? Obviously, well, yeah. He, involved, I mean, he. I mean, the thing was that we were finishing Brighter Later, as I was preparing the ground to leave for California. And you know, in retrospect, you know, I was at the time, you know, I was what twenty-eight or something like that, and I was just burnt out from trying to keep Witch Season alive, and the idea of moving to California and having a salary and having somebody else worry about the, the payroll. Um, you know, I just felt, oh, that's what I need. And, and all the artists, one after another, all the artists that I dealt with at which season started doing something I, against my advice. You know, the Credible String Band became Scientologists. <laughs> you know, um, <clears throat> Richard started arguing with me over his solos, you know, there was, um, and, um, and refused to allow poor Will and the Jolly Hangman to go on Full House, which I thought was essential to make the album rounder. And um, one after another, there was one thing. And then Nick, at the end of Brighter Later, at the, when we finished mixing it, he turned to me and he said, the next album I'm gonna do is just guitar and voice. And I thought, well, you don't need me for that. And so when the offer came to go to, you know, work at Warner Brothers, I said, yeah, I'm out of here. And so the, um, that was um, the end of 1970. And, and then, you know, and then he went in the studio with John and made the album that now sells twice as much as <laughs> Five Leaves Left or Brighter Later. Not but, twice as much, but a lot more. Yeah. And of but course before, it, before I'd even done that, actually, I don't know if Joe even remembers this, but he, Joe left me a, a, Joe's legacy for me when he decided to go back to America was, he said to me, do you think you could make a record with John Martin, solo record with John Martin for 2,000 quid? <laughs> and that was um, Bless the Weather. And that, so that was my first... So that was a nice, a nice yeah, legacy. So yeah. The first <laughs> time you, I actually put a producer's hat on for what it's worth. And, uh, yeah, and uh, so uh, that, uh, but just to finish on the Nick Drake story, obviously yeah. it has a tragic ending, yeah. as we know yeah. that he died of an overdose of antidepressants and the coroner recorded a verdict of suicide, although I think, Joe, you might doubt well, that. You know, but I think, I'm just going to get yeah, to... Because, yeah. John, I think you had to call Joe and tell him... No, 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 no. We were in America doing something when we both. No, were no, that, we? that's when that's when we heard about about. No, Martin. I know about Floyd. Uh, they've been, no, uh, not Floyd. No, about no. Um, Nick Fairport, but Nick. I don't. I was in California. I don't think you were there. Yeah, I think I was. I, th yeah. I think well, I was because we didn't. Neither of us went to the funeral. That's right, that's right, that's right. You must have heard the news of his death, and that must oh, have yeah. been yeah, 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 yes, yes, yes. And I remember, yeah. and I think it may but, have been Sheila, my wife, who called me. But I mean, yeah. I don't think wouldn't it wasn't we a, weren't surprised. It wasn't a huge surprise. Yeah, we weren't because surprised. he'd been getting worse. Yeah. He was yeah. getting worse and worse. Yeah. And and you know, and here's a guy I mean, here's the, the story of Nick in a way, in from A to Z Z 
in the studio. You know, he, in the studio, I think, I don't think I'm exaggerating. John will probably tell me I'm exaggerating. But we, at a certain point, John and I got in the habit when we were recording Nick with a bunch of other musicians. Nick's guitar playing was always perfect. He never made a mistake. And so we would sometimes switch off the monitor of Nick's guitar and voice even and listen to the bass and drums and the strings or whatever else was going on because that was where the little subtle mistakes might happen that you would not want to miss. And you would not want to say, okay, we've got, a, we've got a good take, and then find out when you go to mix it that there's something a little wrong. And um, because Nick was just perfect. And then we'd listen back with Nick in the mix, and it would be great. And, but we would have stopped, okay, let's start again, because some of the bass player made a mistake. And then... Four years later, we're in the studio recording those famous last four songs, Hanging on a Star and all those, and Nick couldn't play and sing at the same time. He had to, he laid down a guitar track and then we overdubbed voice. And the contrast between this consummate master, you know, who was absolutely more in charge of his instrument than almost anyone else I've ever worked with, more in command, I should say. And this guy who struggled to put down a guitar track set without, and he couldn't f f sing and play at the same time well enough to record. That was the deterioration of mm -hmm. Nick. Thank the reason you. I haven't got uh, the original album cut here is because the albums, are, I've got the, a, a box set of, of the three albums, but the reason I haven't got them is because they're 500 pounds each now. Oh, <laughs> those, yes. are those original albums, yes, you know, that's how much they, they, they go but for. Let, let's talk about John Martin for a second. Because yes, right. John, I mean, John was a, a, an, an incredibly uh, interesting character. Yes. Uh, I remember you watching a BBC that. Four documentary about him and his excessive habits and, yeah. and all yeah. of that. So when you're working with John Martin on Bless the Weather and on Solid Air, what was his approach in the studio? Um, what was his approach? Well, uh, I, think, I don't think John was ever very confident. Well, certainly the two records I did with him, he, I, I don't think he was ever very confident when he made them. Um, he would... Uh, it, it was... Bless the Weather was easier to make than, than Solid Air um, because I didn't have a pr problem with getting, the, getting him to use the people I wanted him to play with. Um, and because we, I think we used DM, I think Peggy's on it. Uh, Dave Maddox. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Dan is on it. Um, but then when we came to make <coughs> Solid Air, he decided that he wanted... To use a complete, he'd, he'd he'd been doing stuff with Kossoff, and had wanted to sort of change direction. And I don't know, obviously didn't see himself in a folk dimension at all. I think even, he saw himself much more as a jazz person. And and the first session we ever did for uh, Solid Air, which was at Sound Techniques, he turned up with this. The rhythm section that he determined he was going to use. Um, I think we had Rabbit on, we still had Rabbit on keyboards, but the bass and the bass and drums I'd never worked with before. And I thought they were terrible. And uh, anyway. Uh, Did you tell him? I didn't have to. I fell down the stairs, actually. <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah, I literally fell down the stairs at Sound Techniques. Because as you already said, we had this. It, we had a very eccentric staircase that we'd origi the original staircase up to the office was made of Dexian. <laughs> <laughs> so, and anyway, and it had an un, un you know, un irregular, un irregular uneven, rather yeah. gap at the, on the last step. Anyway, I, I went over, sprained an ankle, and we had to postpone the sessions. And because I couldn't work, at which point we couldn't get the drummer and the bass player back. So luckily, we got Danny back. John sacrificed got Danny Thompson himself. Back. Yeah, we got Danny back. And, That's and, very and, sacrificing, and, and isn't it? Yeah, yeah, and DM. 
and, th- and then we went into Basing St- Basing Strasser, was used to and call then it. That, then and that changed. I mean, that's another classic album, of yes, course. Yeah, and, 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 without and, your and, sprained ankle, yeah, it could have been very music, different. Yeah, it could have, have been a bunch yeah. of old rubbish. Well, without my sprained ankle, I think probably he would have fired me off the job because I, I wasn't getting on at all with this rhythm section. We, we're <laughs> going to have to draw this to a close unless there's an urgent question. I just wanted to ask you about your relationship because I read that you've been described as the good cop, bad cop in no, the studio. No, that. Is that Can fair? We? No, no I, I mean... I don't know which was the good cop and which was the bad cop, by the way. I'm not going <laughs> to venture a view about that. No, I mean, there was, there was a... John always had a slight... You know, that, that debate about Levon Helm's drum sound, you know. I mean, I would sort of be, oh, how great, you guys bought the big pink album, isn't it great? <laughs> And then, you know, Mattex would say, come on, John, can't you get my snares? And John would say, you know, don't talk rubbish. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so there was that element. But, um, but also, b- between, without the artists around, I think um, one of the things that has been the most formative and important thing for me in learning about producing records was the good luck I had in, you know, ending up at Sound Techniques and working with John. Because in subsequent years, I worked with some very great engineers. But, you know, they're used to being nice. They're used to pleasing a client. You know, they have clients who come in who are paying well. You don't want to really rub them the wrong way. John never worried about that. <laughs> you know, and, and so I felt, but it was so great. It was liberating because I felt free to say, I got an idea. Let's do this. Let's try this. And John would say, you're out of your fucking mind. <laughs> and, and, um, and I would, uh, and, and I would say, oh, really? Why? And then he'd explain why. Oh, okay. Well, I guess that doesn't work. But sometimes I would say, I don't care, we're doing it anyway. And, but it was great to know that there was this sort of control mechanism that I could push the boundaries and try new ideas and things, and I could rely on John telling me I was out of my mind um, when I was. Right, well, and, it, and it was also a two-way thing, you know? I mean, I, I would never have got to learn about half half as much as I ended up by knowing about music and I would have never had the opportunity to work with some of the musicians I've worked with you know, you know. if it wasn't for Joe yeah oh yeah, yeah. I, I had a charmed in some ways a charmed life because I, you know if I hadn't have found somebody else I could shout at I'd have been out of what would I have been doing? I don't know. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, will you please say thank you to Joe Boyd and John Wood. Thank you.